Do you have a good day? Good week? Good, good. My van broke down today, so I was, I was, but it got fixed. So I was, I was all in the fuddle today, rushing around, trying to get it fixed. Anyway, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can be here. And I pray, Lord, that you will just speak to our hearts, our minds, and open, Lord, our hearts to the truth. And Lord, I pray, just protect us from deception. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, tonight we're going to look at prophecies, superpowers. And tonight, now I've already given you a lot of clues to the Mark of the Beast, when we did the Mark of the Beast issue. And now tonight I'm going to give you some more clues. And we're going to home in now. Remember we talked about the feet on that big statue of Daniel chapter 2? So we're going to, we're going to delve a little bit deeper. Now, in this world we have superpowers, we've got America, we had the USSR, which is now just Russia. And the same in the Bible tells us that during Bible times, it outlined different nations that affected the people of God. Examples were Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Persia. So all the nations that are found in the Bible that pertain to the people of God. Now this is found in Revelation chapter 2, 2 and 3. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So here it's talking about, in, in the first couple of chapters of Revelation, it talks about something called the seven churches. And the seven churches are timelines. And here it's talking about a group in this particular church where they are faithful, they're patient. And this is the kind of experience that we're going to need in our time. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And this is what's happening in our time, where people profess to believe in God, but they have left their first love. Does anyone ever remember their first car? Yeah, I remember my first car, and although it was tacky, <laughs> it was, and rusty, and when it start up in the mornings, I always loved my first car. It was like my first love. And so we, and, this, and the same principle here is that Christ is saying, you have profession, profession, you've got patience, but you have left off truly loving me. Remember therefore, what does it mean to remember? Remind ourselves, isn't it? So remember therefore from where you have fallen, <coughs> repent and do the first works. This is an admonition to us today. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And that was the same principle we found when the Babylonians invaded uh, Jerusalem. God was trying to teach them, trying to wake them up to their sins. So don't, don't be surprised if some things happen in your life. It's there to sharpen you up. Sharpen you up. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just like I hope in nine times out of ten, not a hundred percent unfortunately, but nine times out of ten, a parent would rather die for their child than let their child die. I know you've got the odd anomaly, but most of the time a parent would rather die than the child die. Yet the day before you see the mother slapping or spanking the child, is it because they don't love them or cruel to them? No, it's because there has to be something called redemptive discipline. <coughs> but it doesn't mean that the parent wouldn't be willing to die for the child. And it's the same thing with the Father in Heaven. So let's have a look then in the book of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 2, to recap, we had Babylon head of gold, we had Persia, the chest and arms of silver, we had Greece, the thighs of brass, we had Rome, the legs of iron, then we had divided Rome and church and state as the feet of iron and of clay. So, just to recap Daniel chapter 2, Thou art this head of gold, thy kingdom is given to the Medes and the Persians, and Greece conquered Medo-Persia, and Rome conquered the Greek Empire, and now we're in the time of the church and state relationship. Daniel had a dream. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. 
So what kind of symbols then did the Lord show Daniel in vision? And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man's and a man's heart was given to it. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And I behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. Now this beast couldn't be named, because there was no such beast on the earth. And strong and exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Do you know any animals with iron teeth? I've met some humans with some metal teeth, okay, but I've never met any animals with iron teeth. In fact, I've met some humans with gold teeth, but never an animal with a metal tooth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this form, on this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So what do these beasts represent then? First off, Revelation 17.15 tells us, The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. We saw that these beasts came out of the sea. So they came out of populous nations, they came out of turmoil, they came out of peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. And the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom. So it's telling us now that these beasts are kingdoms. Remember last time we looked at the eagle? The eagle represented America. And then we said this was Canada, the beaver. And in England was the lion. Can anyone remember France? The cockerel. Chicken. What other prophecy also outlines the four kingdoms from the time of Babylon? So, we've seen it in Daniel 2. The image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Notice how the two prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7 compare. We see uh, the Daniel 2 image, but then when we compare it to Daniel chapter 7, we see that the beasts line up with the metals. So we have the lion will represent Babylon, the bear Medo-Persia, the, the uh, leopard with the four heads and four wings is Greece, and the dreadful beast, dreadful beast is Rome. Now, we're not going to have time to look into Daniel chapter 8, but if you read Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, list some other animals and Daniel chapter 8 actually states that this is Medo-Persia and then this beast is Greece and this beast is an unknown quantum okay so you probably wonder well how do I know this we're gonna go through the history but Daniel chapter 8 also confirms Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 so that's your homework so the first was like a lion and had an eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. Now this is representative of Babylon. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. So it starts off with a... So if I said that someone's got a lion's heart, what would you think of? 
powerful and courage. Remember Richard the Lionheart? Okay. Now if I said someone's got a man's heart compared to a lion's heart, what, what's the comparison? He's basically not so brave, he's become kind of cowardice. And that's exactly what happened with Babylon. And Babylon, the, the imagery is full of lions. Has anyone ever seen a lion, by the way? Have you ever heard it roar? Shakes the ground. I, I, I saw, I'm going to say a real one, but I, I saw a wild one in, in Africa, and it roared. Fortunately, there was a cage between me and it, but the ground shaked. Ferocious animal. That's why they call it king of the jungle. And Babylon was full of these lions. Now the lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way. Found that in Jeremiah 4 chapter 7. And his chariots like a whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. So this term eagles, when he's talking about eagles wings, it's talking about swiftness. Okay? So you have a, you have a lion with eagles wings. This is representing, you've got, a, you've got a ferocious animal, something with power, okay, courageous, and it works with great speed. That's what it's referring to, and that's exactly what happened with Babylon. It rose up very quickly and powerfully, and it took over the known world very, very quickly and suddenly. And here we see some ruins um, of lions. And that's a human. There's a lion on top of a human there. And by the way, to be a true Babylonian, to be, to be king of Babylon, the king had to prove himself by killing a lion. If he couldn't kill a lion, he wasn't worthy to be king. Lots of lions. So here we see the lion, okay, with the two wings. It's coming out of the sea, but then we see the wings are plucked off. That means it comes to a stage where this nation no longer becomes powerful, okay, no longer has speed, and now becomes a coward with a man's heart. And that's exactly what happened. This is outlined in Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, this was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He basically was into adultery, he was into fornications, orgies, and basically he was into drinking alcohol, and he had no interest in battles or conquest. He basically just lived up the life, okay, he had plenty of money, and so the nation of Babylon turned into something with a man's heart. And that night he requested to have the golden cups that were from Jerusalem, and the uh, on the wall was written with, with, with no hand, a bloodless hand, and he wrote these words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Yufasim, and he called all the magicians, and they couldn't answer it, and finally Daniel comes in and tells him, your kingdom is over. And that very night, the kingdom was finished, the, the Medes and Persians came in, and we talked about that the other night, how Cyrus was predicted 150 years in the book of Isaiah before the event, and even described how they were going to take the city. And suddenly, another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side. Raised up on one side, there was two nations, Medo, Persia, representing its lopsidedness. It had three ribs, representing that, that uh, when Medo, Persia came into power, it conquered the three most powerful nations, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And it had three ribs in its mouth, between its teeth, and they said, dust to it, arise, devour much flesh. And so, the Medes were the stronger initially, but the Persians then took over. Three ribs, Babylon, Egypt and Lydia. And they represent the silver in Daniel chapter 2. And after this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings, but this time of a bird. What's faster, eagle or a bird? An eagle. Okay, so what it's trying to tell us here that it was fast, but not really as fast as the eagle. Plus, what's more graceful, an eagle or a fowl? An eagle. So when, so when um, Babylon was conquering, it was, let me say, it was a very sophisticated, it was a very, eagles are very sophisticated bird. It did it in style, okay? Whereas when you got fowls, they're like common birds. So though it was fast, it wasn't in the same style okay, as Babylon. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So this represented Greece. Why four heads? 
because Alexander the Great was the one that brought Greece, united Greece, and took over the known world. But when he died, okay, he had a child, but the child was basically assassinated, and eventually his kingdom divided up amongst his strongest four generals. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, which is why you have four heads. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now I want you to note that you have this beast, and it has ten horns. Where are the ten horns? It's on the beast. The ten horns is not separate from the beast, it is on the ten horns. It is, so it's on the fourth beast, it's part of the fourth beast. And this represented Rome. So you can see it, each time that, that as each kingdom came into power, it was taking more and more and more territory. And then we come to the feet, which was iron and clay, which we said was a church-state relationship within divided Roman Empire. Now, when Rome broke up in 476, it broke up into the ten nations. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Now, if Rome was the fourth beast, okay, and ten kings came out from this fourth beast, but history also tells us that the Western Roman Empire split into ten nations. So what additional information do we find in Daniel 7 that is not in chapter 2? And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. The court was seated and the books were opened. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. It's talking about the father, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. He's talking about here this thing given to the flame, burning flame. He's talking about when he saw this little horn power. Um, that's what he's talking about. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. So all of a sudden now, we're looking at a little horn. Now we're looking at a judgment. And the books were opened. I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient days. This Son of Man is Jesus Christ. He existed before He was born. Like one, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient days, and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve Him. It's talking about Jesus Christ. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So we see this little horn, then we see a judgment, and then we see God's kingdom. So we see here that before God sets up His kingdom, there is a judgment before the second coming. And we also see that this judgment is also connected to this little horn power. Therefore we know that this judgment takes place during the reign of this little horn power. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Anyone ever had a nightmare? I came near to one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So now, the Bible is going to tell us what the first half of Daniel 7 means. These great beasts, which are four, are what? Four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, kingdom of what? Kingdom of this earth, and possess the kingdom forever, 
even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spake pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So, the little horn. Daniel 7.21 I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So another thing this tells me then that this little horn power okay, lasts all the way to the Second Coming. Takes us all the way to the Second Coming. Just like when we looked at the feet of iron and clay takes us right to the Second <coughs> Coming. So, question then. Let's list the ten identifying points of the little horn kingdom. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise, what? After them. So you have ten kings, it has to come after. So in effect it's like the eleventh king in one aspect. And he shall be different from the first and he shall subdue three kings. So it's saying that you have ten, another one comes up and then this little one that comes up kills three kings. Three out of those ten kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High who is God and shall wear out the saints which is God's people of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time times and the dividing of time and if you remember when we were looking for the ark of the covenant where did we find it in the Re revelation 11:19, we saw that the ten commandments are where in heaven therefore if the ten commandments are in heaven no one on earth can change god's commandments and the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So, this is talking about the divided Roman Empire. So, clue one then, it arises out of the fourth kingdom of Rome. And I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them. So, remember we, we said it comes up among them and after the ten horns. Therefore, must comes up among the ten horns among the nations of Europe. This is where the little horn power must be. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and shall subdue three kings. So he uproots three kingdoms. And we find exactly in history that what took place. When the Roman Empire divided by 476, three of the kingdoms were destroyed after that. We have the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And another shall rise after them. So, comes to power sometime after 476 AD. He shall be different from the first ones. So, different from the other nations. The same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, shall persecute the saints of the Most High makes war with the saints. In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking pompous words. So it has eyes and the mouth of a man. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, speaks pompous or great words against God. He shall intend to change times and laws. Notice that word intend. He can't change God's laws. God's laws are fixed but he attempts to. Or in the King James Version it says he thinks to change times and laws. Thinks to change the times and laws of God. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and a times and half a time. 
So it reigns for three and a half prophetic years. That's what a time, times and the dividing of a time consists of. So, this power would attempt to change the very law of God because it thinks to change times and laws. So who or what then is this little horn? As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So how do the prophecies of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 compare? Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Where did we see this leopard? In Daniel chapter 7. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Where did we see this? Daniel chapter 7. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Daniel chapter 7. And the dragon gave him his power. So, how did the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 predict the same kingdom then? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, Revelation 13, 5. He was given authority to continue to 42 months. 42 months is, by the way, three and a half years. It was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And that's exactly the same characteristics we find in Daniel chapter 7 with the little horn. So what did the three and a half years or 42 months symbolize? They symbolize 1260 years. I have laid on you a day for a year. This is in Ezekiel 4.6. In Bible prophecy, we are given uh, a clue. And it tells us that one prophetic day is equivalent to one prophetic year. One prophetic day, okay, yeah, so equals yeah, equals a prophetic year, which is, which is uh, a year. Now, tomorrow, if you can make it tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about Islam in Bible prophecy at 11 o'clock, and tomorrow I'm going to prove to you that when you apply a day for a year principle, that there's a prophecy that was fulfilled that establishes and confirms a day for a year. Okay? Forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty two sorry, namely forty forty years, a day for a year. They should feed her there one thousand and two hundred and sixty days where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. So in Revelation chapter 12 is talking about the same event, tells us what a times, time and a half a time is. It's saying it is 1260 days. That's how we get three and a half years or 42 months. So that's how we work it out. 1260 days, a day for a year, gives us 1260 years. So what happens at the end of the 1260 years? years. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. So Revelation 13 tells us that there's a deadly wound that happens after this time period. What additional insights do we find in Revelation 13 then? An authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will what? <coughs> Worship him. Remember we've been stressing this whole Mark of the Beast issue is revolving around worship. Which world power best fulfills then the Bible's ten identifying points for the little horn and the beast? So what I'm going to prove to you is that the same power in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn, is the same power we find in Revelation 13. So now I just want to stress we're talking about a system, not individuals. We're about to identify a system here, okay? And there are many sincere people in this system and God recognizes many of them as his. So this is not an attack on any person, it is simply the identification that the Bible tells us are the identifying marks and this power fits the key. Three keys to correct interpretation of prophecies. One, we need to read the Bible prophecy, we need to read the Bible's own interpretation and then we look for the historical fulfillment. So this little horn power 
And this beast we find in Revelation 13 is the Roman Catholic Church. So let's look at the clues then. Prophecy. It rises out of the fourth kingdom of Rome. The fulfillment, the medieval Roman Church came out of Rome itself. And where do we find the Vatican? In Rome. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome, which took place in 330 AD. And at this time, one might have predicted her speedily decline. But the development and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome or the pope gave her a new lease of life and made her again the capital this time the religious capital of the civilized world prophecy then comes up among the ten horns and the Roman Church came up in Europe and it came up after the Roman Empire was divided into the ten nations of Europe the prophecy then uproots three kingdoms the fulfillment, the Herali, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths were destroyed. You know why? Because they refused to believe the same belief system as the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman papacy got all its allies and says, please, we need these three nations destroyed because they don't believe in Jesus like we believe in Jesus. In fact, they don't believe uh, in traditional aspects that we believe. They like to worship differently to how we worship, therefore we want them destroyed, and that's exactly what took place. Now it's interesting that for this papacy power to take dominion, or to be that 11th kingdom, if I can put it that way, it had to destroy these three kingdoms. Why? Because these three kingdoms were stopping the papacy from taking control and power over the known world. Once these three were removed, the papacy then had supreme power. And that took place in 538 AD. I might cite that three that were eradicated from before the Pope, viz. the Heroli, under Odessa, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. In the very beginning of the year, 538, Belisarius put an end to the empire of the Goths at Rome, leaving no power therein but the bishops of that metropolis. So it comes to power after AD 476, and the Pope gained power over Europe in AD 538 after Rome fell. And that's when we tick off the 1260 years. Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. So we see 538 and we see 1798. The Ostrogoths, the last of the Aryan kingdoms to oppose the Roman Church, were overthrown in the year 538 AD. So in 538 AD, we have supreme combination of church and state with the church controlling the state. So then what happened then? in 1798. After exactly 1260 years, Napoleon's general Berthier entered into the Vatican and took the Pope prisoner. If you take a king prisoner, are they now reigning? No. So exactly after the time prophecy, because it says, for a time, times and dividing in time, it will do those things. And Revelation 13 talks about a deadly wound with the same time dates. Exactly after 1260 years, the Pope, the Pope was taken prisoner and the papacy okay, lost its power. But let me ask you a question. Did the papacy still exist after 1798? Yes, it did. The difference is it no longer controlled the state. For 1260 years, you have a church-state relationship with the church controlling the state. After 1798, the papacy no longer has political power. But if you can remember in Revelation 13, it said something happened to that deadly wound. Do you remember what happened? Healed. A time is coming when that deadly wound will be healed, 
What does that mean? It tells us that church and state is going to come back together again and guess who's going to be in control? The religion. And not just some ordinary religion, but you're going to have papal religion will be in control and will be in power over the state. And I will prove this all to you. Out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman Church. The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifex Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. If anyone took the opportunity to get hold of my DVD called Revelation 17, I've got five hours of this history. Okay, I go through all the symbolism, I go through all this history, I go through how pagan Rome transferred over to papal Rome. If you can stomach it, it's five hours worth. <laughs> Whatever elements the barbarians and Arians left came under the protection of the Bishop of Rome, who was the chief person thereafter the empire's disappearance. The Roman Church in this way privily pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire of which it is the actual continuation. And the point I'm trying to make as well is that Pontifex Maximus was the title of the Caesars. And before the Caesars took it, it was the title of the high priest of the Babylonian worship system. Today, the papacy, the Pope, takes the title Pontifex Maximus. The popes filled the vacant place of the emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, prestige and titles from paganism. Prophecy then. It was different from the other nations. How? The medieval Roman church is both a religious and political kingdom found in every country professing Jesus Christ. <coughs> Vatican City is an independent state. In fact, it's the smallest country in the world. It is the richest country in the world. Vatican City is an independent state with its own laws, military, stamps, and ambassadors to most nations. Besides the emperors at Constantinople and the various German kings, there grew up in Europe a line, sorry, grew up in Europe a line of rulers far more powerful than any of these, the popes. The longest and mightiest line of rulers that the world has ever seen. Meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ, the Pope, took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through many ages. Sovereignty over Vatican City is exercised by the Pope in his function as supreme head of the Catholic Church. The 50 or so countries maintaining permanent diplomatic relations with it implicitly recognize its sovereign status. The smallest sovereign country is the state of Vatican City, which is an enclave within Rome and the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. Prophecy makes war with the saints. Fulfillment. The medieval church made war with millions of faithful Bible believing Christians. Some tell us over 120 million were killed because they believed in the Bible. In 1252, Innocent IV sanctioned the infliction of torture by the civil authorities upon heretics, and torture came to have a recognized place in the procedure of the inquisitorial courts. Pope Gregory XIII memorialized the massacre of 50,000 Protestants by having a medal made. That the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. The world of medieval Catholic Europe operated under a set of much different circumstances. They did what they felt was right in the eyes of God. They were not sinners and did not necessarily use poor judgment. If you think that the Inquisition was evil or misguided, just consider the state of those countries today where the Inquisitions were the most active. Spain, Portugal and Italy, nearly everyone in those countries is Catholic. And Dr. William Carroll responded, well stated. Prophecy, eyes and the mouth of a man, fulfillment, the leader of the church sees and speaks for it. The Pope himself is infallible. 
He cannot sin, he cannot do anything wrong. Prophecy speaks pompous words. Pope Leo the Thirteenth, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Who holds the, the place? The Popes. Pope Leo the Thirteenth claimed that he is God Almighty on earth. Does the priest merely pray that your sins will be forgiven? No. Acting as God's instrument and ordained minister, he truly forgives the sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. The Pope is supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vicegerent of Christ and is not only a priest forever, but also king of kings and lord of lords. Who's king of kings and lord of lords? Prophecy thinks to change the times and laws of God. Notice he thinks he cannot. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts in the place of God upon earth. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. In the Ten Commandments, we find in the Second Commandment, a commandment that tells us, and we talked about this other night, that we should not have any idols, we should not create idols, and we should not bow down and worship idols. In the Catechism, the Church has deleted the Second Commandment. Catholic leadership have thought to change times. They claim to have changed the Sabbath from the 7th to the 1st also. So what they've done is they've removed the Second Commandment. So the 3rd now becomes the 2nd, the 4th now becomes the 3rd. And then when you get to the, the ninth, the 10th that's now the ninth, they split the ninth into 2, so now you get 10 again. And so what they've done, they've done two things. They've deleted one of the commandments, number two, so that then you can bow down and pray to idols, okay, and saints. And then they've changed the Sabbath. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Can man change God's laws? No. The very laws which are in heaven? But... That's exactly what he's done. The Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. So God writes this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But Rome says, the Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from what? Saturday to Sunday. Now some people got this idea that Sunday is the seventh day. It's not. It's the first day of the week. And the papacy itself claims and says, yes, we change the day of the Sabbath. How, we ask, have you, Protestants, managed to receive her, the Catholic Church's teaching, or your life, in direct opposition to your recognized teacher, the Bible, on the Sabbath question? You see, Protestants claim we are the Bible and the Bible only, but the Catholic Church says to them, if you're the Bible and the Bible only, why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? You keep the Sabbath because you acknowledge that we are Mother Church. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So, if you keep the, the Catholic Sabbath, you're acknowledging her authority over you. 
Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of the fact. This was Melanchthon. Melanch Everyone heard of Martin Luther? Yeah, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, like in the 1500s. This was his companion, Melanchthon. I'll try and read it in Old English style. But He changes the times and the laws, or when they change ye Saturday into Sunday, they have changed God's laws and turned them into their own traditions to be kept above God's precepts. Now Martin Luther, he was totally against the Sabbath, but his friend Melanchthon said, no, we should be Sabbath keepers. She substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day. A change for which there is no scriptural authority. Okay, we'll quickly go through this. Some people claim that um, the early Christians kept Sunday, and in certain areas they did, namely in Rome, then Egypt. But throughout the centuries in other parts of the world, there were other Christians that kept the Sabbath. Here we find the ancient Christians were very careful in the observ observation of Saturday or Seventh Day. It is plain that all the Oriental churches, Oriental churches, China, Asia, and the greatest part of the world observed the Sabbath as a festival. Ambrose, the celebrated Bishop of Milan, which was right north uh, above Italy, said that when he was in Milan, he observed the Saturday, but when in Rome, he observed Sunday. This gave rise to the proverb, when you are in Rome, do as the Romans do. Fifth century, the people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assembled together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed at Rome or Alexandria. Sixth century, the Scottish Church. In this latter instance, they seem to have followed a custom of which we find traces in the early monastic church of Ireland by which they held Saturday to be the Sabbath on which they rested from all their labours. We esteem to see here an allusion to the custom observed in the early monastic church of Ireland of keeping the day of rest on Saturday or the Sabbath. Everyone heard of Patrick, St. Patrick? We celebrate St. Patrick's Day, okay? And, and it's made out that he was a Catholic saint. St. Patrick, the evidence points to, kept the seventh day Sabbath. Seventh century. Professor J.C. Moffat, I'm not sure what, uh, I think Doctor of Divinity, Professor of Church History at Princeton says, It seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep Saturday. They observed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. The Celts used a Latin Bible, unlike the Vulgate, and kept Saturday as a day of rest with special religious services on Sunday. 8th century. Widespread and enduring was the observance of the seventh day Sabbath among the believers of the Church of the East and St. Thomas Christians of India, who never connected with Rome. They kept the Sabbath in India. 10th century, the Nestorians eat no pork and keep the Sabbath. They believe in neither oracular confession nor purgatory. They worked on Sunday but kept Saturday in a sabbatical manner. That's in Scotland. 11th century, 11th, 12th century. The observance of Saturday is, as everyone knows, the subject of bitter dispute between the Greeks and the Latins. There is much evidence that the Sabbath prevailed in Wales uni universally until A.D. 1115, when the first Roman bishop was seated at St. David's. The old Welsh Sabbath keeping churches did not even then altogether bow the knee to Rome, but fled to their hiding places. Traces of Sabbath keepers are found in the times of Gregory I, Gregory VII, and in the 12th century in Lombardy. And Robertson gives accounts of some of the Waldensians of the Alps who were called Sabati, uh, Sabatitai, uh, in Sabatitai, but more frequently in Sabatitai. One says they were so named from the Hebrew Sabbath because they kept the Saturday for the Lord's Day. 13th century. They say that the blessed Pope Sylvester was the Antichrist of whom mention is made in the epistles of St. Paul as having been the son of perdition. 
They also say that keeping of the Sabbath ought to take place. The inquisitors declare that the sign of the Vaudois, deemed worthy of death, was that he followed Christ and sought to keep the commandments of God. 14th century. In 1310, 200 years before Luther's thesis, the Bohemian Brethren constituted one-fourth of the population of Bohemia. Erasmus pointed out how strictly Bohemian Waldensians kept the seventh day Sabbath. 17th century. Some have suffered torture because they would not rest when others kept Sunday, for they declared it to be the holiday and law of Antichrist. So, prophecy. Reigns for three and a half prophetic years. The papacy ruled for exactly 1260 years from 538 to 1798. In 1798, he birthed and made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So, we have this then. Head of all the holy churches and head of all the holy priests of God, that is the papacy. This decree went into effect in 530 AD when the last of the Aryan horns was plucked up, namely the Ostrogoths. Vigilis is the first of a series of popes more and more involved in worldly events and who no longer belong solely to the church. The ultimate humiliation of the church came when Pius VI was driven from Rome by the French armies in 1798. Revelation 13 tells us it was the deadly wound. The deadly wound will be healed. Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed the Republic. No wonder that half of Europe thought the papacy was dead. The papacy was extinct, not a vestige of its existence remained, and among all the Roman Catholic powers not a finger was stirred in its defence. The Eternal City had no longer prince or pontiff, its bishop was dying, a captive in foreign lands, and the decree was announced that no successor would be allowed in his place. <clears throat> okay, Catholic Encyclopedia Online. No one who is interested in human history, past and present, can ignore the Catholic Church, either as an institution which has been the central figure in the civilized world for nearly 2,000 years. Decisively affecting its destinies, religious, literally, or scientific, social, and political, or as an existing power whose influence and activity extend to every part of the globe. Many of the great Christians of Reformation and post-Reformation times shared this view of prophetic truth and identified the Roman papacy among adherents to this interpretation were the Waldensians, the Baptists and the Methodists. I considered the ten horns and behold they came up among them another little horn before whom were three of the first horns plucked up of the roots. And it says by the roots which means when you take something out of the roots it ceases to exist. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking great things. And this has been identified as the papacy. So, let's summarize. Came up among the ten European kingdoms, after they had arisen, 476 AD, has a man at its head who speaks for it, uprooted three European kingdoms, grew from pagan Rome, was more stout or strong than the other kingdoms, is diverse, different from other kingdoms, because he had a church-state relationship, persecuted God's church, reigned for exactly three and a half times or three and a half prophetic years or 1260 literal years speaks great words against God and thinks it can change God's law now Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 is the same power it is the papacy and this is going to help you when we identify the mark of the beast because I'm telling you now I'm really telling you now who the beast is the little horn power is the papacy, has the same characteristics of the first beast in Revelation 13. The little horn was a blasphemous power, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and the leopard beast of Revelation 13.6 does the same. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. The little horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. 
in Daniel 7.21. This beast also in Revelation 13.7 makes war with the saints and overcomes them. And the little horn had a mouth speaking great things. Of this beast we read, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. The little horn arose on the cessation of the pagan form of the Roman Empire. The beast of Revelation 13.2 arises at the same time for the dragon pagan Rome gives him his power, his seat and great authority. Power was given to the little horn to continue for a time, times and the dividing of time or 1260 years. And in Dan, uh, which is Daniel 7.25 and to this beast also power was given for 42 months or 1260 years. Revelation 13.5 Things to change times and laws, Daniel 7.25 And in Revelation 13.12 Forces a false worship And in 13.16 causes all to receive a mark At the end of that specified period of 1260 years The saints, times and laws were to be taken out of the hand of the little horn And the first beast has life for 42 months At the end of the same period the leopard beast was himself to be led into captivity and Revelation 13.10, both these specifications were fulfilled in the captivity and exile of the Pope and the temporary overthrow of the papacy by France in 1798. Okay, Daniel 7, 26-28. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, which is my mind, my body, my thoughts, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. <coughs> so, God has already revealed to us in Bible prophecy, before it even took place, what was going to take place, who this little horn power is, and what the beast is going to be, what the mark of the beast is going to be, and what the image of the beast is going to be. It's God has all outlined this information. The question then for you and me then, is do you want to accept Jesus' offer of being one of his subjects and to be a part of his kingdom? To be one of those saints who would rather die than break one of his commandments. That's what God is waiting for. And we will continue this theme as we go through the subjects because I still haven't dealt with the mark of the beast and I promise I will. That's the question for us to consider. <laughs>